Okay, you're good. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, in case you guys weren't already in the meeting earlier, Ryan did mention that since we are recording this, if you're not comfortable um, being recorded and we will be posting this video on YouTube, feel free to just keep your cameras off. But anyone that um, would love to be engaging and turn on the cameras, you're more than welcome to. So today, Brian and I, we will be talking about dental school scholarships and extracurricular activities. And we're part of the UCLA ASDA Pre-Dental Outreach Committee. So my name is Sarah Nagamina. I am a D1 and I am part of the internal affairs and um, here on the UCLA ASDA Pre-Dental Outreach Committee. And I graduated from University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2019. And I am originally from Santa Cruz, California. Awesome. And I'm Brian. I'm also D1 class of 2025. I graduated from UC Irvine class of 2021. Um, I'm from Orange County, so it's not too far from here. And I'm also the other internal affairs coordinator. Um, and yeah, like Sarah said today, we're just going to be going over some of the dental school scholarships that are out there. We're focusing mainly on the um, full ride or um, scholarships that pay for a significant portion of your dental school expenses. And then we're also going to go over a lot of extracurricular activities that can um, further develop your application and show admissions committees more about who you are as a student and as a person. So yeah, to start, we have the Health Profession Scholarship Program. This is one of the more popular scholarships that dental students apply to, along with the NHSC, which we're also going to talk about. Um, so this scholarship is mainly focused on the military. It's divided into the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the purpose is to provide um, awards to students who are willing to go to school in the medical field or the dental field, um, and then serve that many amount of years back in their respective military um, branch right after they're done with school. So the amount covers all of your tuition, any books, any materials, equipment, and this also includes your loops, which can go up to like three or $4,000 and your health insurance as well. And then there's also a monthly stipend of about $2,000. And this is adjusted based on where you go to school. So um, it's kind of um, based on your cost of living. I know in Westwood here at UCLA, we have a stipend about $2,200, while some other schools might be less if the cost of living is a little bit less. And on top of that, you also get 45 days of officer pay per year which is really nice because it's kind of like a side income that you also get on top of getting all of your education paid for. So the conditions of this scholarship, um, you must commit the amount of years that funding is received. So if you go to um, any four-year dental school, you're going to commit four years after dental school, or if you go to UOP, you'll go for three years and then serve three years afterwards. And the commitment will be returned in the respective military branch that you initially applied to. So the scholarship is actually separated into Army, Navy, and Air Force scholarships. So when you apply, you only apply to one of the branches, not all three. Um, and then if you do get the scholarship, then you'll be serving in whatever branch you apply to. Um, the requirements are not too bad. You just have to be a US citizen, and then you must pass the initial, initial physical exam. And this is honestly the hardest part of the, um, the application process, just because of how tedious it is you have to go to a lot of dental checkups, a lot of medical checkups. You go to a little boot camp where you do a few exercises, nothing crazy, but they do a lot of x-rays on you. Um, they basically examine like everything about you, your blood tests, making sure that you are in good enough shape to actually serve however many years you're going to be serving once you're done with dental school. Um, on top of that, there's two letters of recommendation that you need, one from a dentist and then one from anyone of your choice, but someone in the military is preferred, not required, just to um, show that you have had experience working with people that have gone through the scholarship and kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Um, in addition to that, there's also a personal statement that's about one page. It's not very strict. It's just um, talking about why you want to pursue um, a health career in the military. Um, and then on top of that, um, if you're applying to the Navy specifically and you have a DAT of 23 or higher, you qualify to apply early. So you can apply before um, December 1st, which is when you get your acceptances. And this is kind of a game changer because it's also, the scholarship is also like a rolling basis admissions 
think so. If you apply earlier, you're going to be looked at earlier in a pool of smaller or a smaller pool of applicants. And so you'll have higher chances of getting the scholarship. Um, this isn't a thing for the other two branches, but it is nice if you're doing Navy. Um, on top of that, you also have to submit transcripts, your resume and CV. And then if you're doing Navy or the Air Force, you also have interviews. The interviews are mainly done through the phone, but there are interviews army, you just apply and then you wait for a response. And then the timeline is pretty loose. There's no strict application deadlines, but um, you usually apply right after you submit your application. So um, loosely around July or August is when you would apply right after you submit your access application. And then everything is a rolling basis. My, um, I'm currently on this scholarship under the Army. So my recruiter said that every few months um, after December, there's a meeting where every, they look at all of the applicants and choose out of that pool um, some people to take the scholarship. And so this is where the rolling basis kind of comes into play because there's around three dates, I believe, that they look at all of the applications. So if you're applying early, you'll be in that first pool of applicants where there's less amounts of people that applied and you'll have a higher chance of getting that scholarship. And then decisions roll out anywhere from February to July or August, so right before you start dental school. And the good thing about this scholarship is if you don't get it, it's not the end of the world because there is a wait list for it. And on top of that, there's also a three-year scholarship for all of the programs that you automatically have, um, apply for when you're applying for the four-year scholarship. So um, you'll be considered for the three-year scholarship. And the nice thing about that one is um, you'll have to pay the first year out of pocket, but the next three years will be all covered. And then you'll only have to serve three years instead of four. And then one of the other benefits of um, the this scholarship specifically that's not put on the slide is that um, if you're planning to specialize, especially if you're just in general dentistry and you want to do for example, an AGD, there's a lot of programs out there that are um, tuition based, so you still have to pay, but in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, they actually pay you to do it. So when you go, it's pretty easy to get into these to the AGD programs and you'll be paid um, around like $70,000 as a stipend versus having to pay tuition. And then the next scholarship we have is the, right here, the Health Services Collegiate Program. And this is kind of similar to the HPSP scholarship, but it's Navy specific. Um, this one is also for dental medical and it covers most or all of your tuition, books, materials, equipment, once again, housing. And the housing is also adjusted based on where you go to school. So um, the other things include about this scholarship is that it may not cover all of your expenses because this is um, kind of like an income-based scholarship. So they'll give you a stipend per month, and it's about four to $5,000, but um, that usually won't cover all of your expenses, but it'll cover most of it. Um, and then the conditions for this one are pretty similar as well. Scholars must commit the amount of years funding is received. And then the commitment will be with the Navy. And um, this one's a little bit more specific in terms of having a BMI requirement and body fat requirements. And they actually will um, monitor this throughout your time in dental school. So you'll have to go in for checkups and make sure that you're still within this range so that you're in shape to um, serve those years once you're done with dental school. And then the requirements are kind of the same as well. US citizen accepted or enrolled as a full-time student um, in an accredited school or program and your undergraduate GPA must be above 3.0. And once you're accepted to the scholarship, you must pass your board exams and graduate within four years of enrollment. And then the timeline for this one is the summer before the year of matriculation. Um, and this is a 12 to 16 week application process and decisions are made year round. But one thing to note is you do have to have that acceptance before your program benefits are received. So with this application process, you would want to apply around April or May, which gives you like a three or four month leeway before you start school to get everything done and to get your decision in time. Okay, so next I'm going to be talking about the National Health Service Corps Scholarship. A lot of people might know it as the NHSC Scholarship. So the purpose of this scholarship is to award scholarships to students pursuing eligible primary care health, health profession training. So that's like dentists, physicians, um, nurses as well, um, nurses, uh, oh sorry, nurses as well, NPAs. 
and the amount that they give you, um, they pay for your tuition, reasonable costs such as books, instruments, supplies, insurance, loops, and some other like academic specific uh, costs that the school requires you to pay for. And they do give you a monthly stipend as well. They give you $1,500. However, that's before taxes. So after taxes, it comes out to around um, like a little less than $1,300. And it does not include housing costs. However, you can use a portion of your stipend um, however you would like. So that can be used towards housing if you would um, want to do that. And the conditions of this scholarship is that in return, scholars uh, commit to provide primary care um, in health profession shortage areas. So those are like typically what people consider underserved areas. And you would actually be surprised by the amount of places that are considered underserved. I actually have this scholarship and the way that I found out about this scholarship was I was working at a dental clinic in my hometown, which I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Santa Cruz, but a lot of people associate it with like, oh, like a rich touristy town. However, uh, our neighboring towns uh, are very rich in agriculture and has a super high population of Mexican American immigrants that don't have access to very much healthcare, specifically dentistry. So um, Santa Cruz County is considered underserved, which is something that I didn't know. And I grew up there my whole life. So you would be surprised about the amount of places that are considered underserved. So people might think that you might be stuck in the middle of nowhere, but that isn't necessarily true. And when it comes time to serve your time, you apply just like any other job. So instead of some other scholarships that they'll assign you or send you wherever, you get the choice to apply to specific clinics that you're maybe more interested in others. However, if you don't have um, any success with being paired at a clinic while doing your own job searches, they do have resources that they can help make sure that you find a job. So that way um, you can start repaying your service. And um, some of the requirements for this scholarship is that you have to be a U.S. citizen and you must be accepted or enrolled as a full-time student at an accredited school or program in one of the 50 states or U.S. territories, and you must not have any other existing service obligations, and the application itself is pretty short. There's only three essay questions that are, I think are about like 500 words each, so it's not super long, and you do need two letters of recommendation and you need your transcripts and then you need a resume, which pretty much has like everything that you've done or things that you feel like are valuable that would help um, show them the amount of volunteer work and why they should pick you. And the timeline for this uh, scholarship is that it usually opens up around the beginning of April. So it's actually opened up right now and it closes around the beginning of May. So it's only open for about a month, but um, a lot of the times the essay questions, they're like the same, if not very similar to previous years. So you can kind of get all this stuff prepared beforehand and um, you can find out what the previous year's essay questions were from the NHSC website. They have uh, this thing called the guidelines and it pretty much lays everything out. Like if you were to receive it, what you would be signing on to, and so on. And then when you submit your application, you kind of don't hear for a long time. So it's a little stressful, but they start um, sending out notices around the end of August into the beginning of September. So that's around the time when people will start to hear and they kind of do it in chunks. So a lot of us were looking at um, SDN to kind of get an idea of like, if anyone had heard back and we were, we recognized that they were sending them out little by little. So don't be like super scared if you weren't one of the first people that were accepted because I think I was like one of the last groups that was accepted and it's not based off of like a rolling cycle like the other one, um, one of the other ones that Brian talked about. And to go along with some of the conditions with this, I know that a lot of people get a little bit nervous signing onto a contract. What if I decide I don't wanna do this? And another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of when they go into dental school is if they want to specialize or not. So with the NHSC scholarship, only a few specialties or like residencies are 
like approved, meaning that they will hold off your service work until you complete these programs. And they will um, then after that time at your specialty or your uh, residency, you'll begin to serve in the community to pay off um, like your scholarship. And those specialties are the two general residencies. So GPR and AEGD, and then pediatric, public health, and geriatrics. So those ones are approved, meaning that they will allow you to pursue those post um, like dental school graduation. Um, but if you did want to, during your time here, like, or during your time as a dental student, if you decided that you didn't want to just do general or one of the other res residencies or specialties that I listed, you can um, terminate your contract. And if you terminate your contract while in school, you just pay the amount that they covered for you up until that point, and you have to pay it off within three years of the date of default. So that's an option versus if you were to terminate your contract after you had already graduated, meaning that they already paid for all your school, you would have to pay three times the amount that the scholarship awarded you plus interest. So if you did not want to do this after you had already figured out that you had the scholarship, I would highly suggest that you just terminate it while you are in dental school to avoid that high um, uh, repayment fee. And they will pay for however many years of school that you have like ahead of you. So you can apply as an incoming D1. So you can apply for all four years or you can apply as a D2 and they would pay for the remaining two years and so on. And when you take on a scholarship from your D1 year and you're accepting the four-year um, scholarship, that means that you're going to be paying back four years of service at their clinics. And then for um, two school years, you would be doing um, two years and yeah, so so on like that. And then the next scholarship, I'm not super familiar with this one. I actually wasn't aware of this scholarship until I started doing some research for this presentation. So there is a scholarship called the Indian Health Service Health Professions. And the purpose of this is for American Indian and Alaska Native American students who strive to develop their next generation of leaders, as well as help make a pursuit of meaningful career in Indian health Attain, attain attainable for uh, American Indian and Alaska Native students. And what they do, it's pretty similar to the NHSC. They'll cover your tuition, required fees, and give you a monthly stipend of no less than $1,500. Not sure if that includes taxes or not. And it also does not cover housing costs. And the conditions, it's very similar to the NHSC. You will fulfill a service commitment in a full-time clinical practice at an Indian health facility upon completion of their academic or postgraduate clinical training for a minimum of two years. And requirements for this is that you must be a US citizen or US national, 18 years or older. And for the scholarship, you must be a member of a federally recognized American Indian tribe or Alaska native village a high school graduate and a minimum GPA of 2.0 and you need your transcripts, some letter of recs, an essay and have an intent to serve Indian people as a health profession. So it's pretty similar to the um, NHSC one and the timeline, You, I, I found that it usually opens around mid-December and closes around the end of February. And then some other scholarships that are out there, there's so many out there. So um, try and find ones that you think that suit you and your motives in life. I think that will also give you the most success at um, receiving the scholarships because it does take a lot of work to apply to scholarships. And um, if you apply for ones that you don't think that you'd probably get, then it might not be worth your time, but it's always a chance. So um, some outside resources that you might want to look into are um, like ADA or Colgate. They are like dental focused like organizations and they have a lot of scholarship resources for people. They'll post about some and they themselves offer a lot too. 
And a lot of communities have local scholarships as well. So if you kind of know um, like word around town about specific scholarships, a lot of um, families want to support people in their communities and they'll set up uh, like scholarships in memory of someone that has passed away previously. And schools will also have merit-based scholarships based on like a good academics. So I know at UCLA, that's something that we had. And also keep an eye out for emails from your school. Um, they share a lot of scholarship opportunities. And for example, here at UCLA for dental school, we actually have a general scholarship application that anyone of all years can fill out. And then the um, they'll all sit down, look over applications and pretty much just match people with scholarships that they feel like um, that they should go to certain people based off of their extracurriculars and just they want to do what they want to do with dentistry. And some other places that you can find uh, scholarship opportunities is ASDA and ADA. All right, and then the next portion of our lecture series today will be on extracurricular activities. So why are extracurricular activities so important? Um, the main thing about extracurricular activities is it gives you a chance to showcase who you are. Um, and this is in terms of your application. So on your application, all aside from extracurricular activities, all you really see are your grades and then your personal statement. And although your personal statement does explain a little bit about who you are and what kind of healthcare provider you'll be, your extracurricular activities are where you can kind of do things that back this up, that show admissions committee and whoever's reading your application that what you say is really what you're doing. Um, it displays your life outside of school. So if you say you're passionate about certain things, this is where you're going to prove that you really are passionate about these things, that you really want to do these things and you're not just um, doing it for the sake of you know, having a good application. Extracurricular activities can do really well to add character and personality to your application. Um, your extracurricular activities don't necessarily have to be dental related. They can be literally anything from like doing um, Greek life to doing like intramural sports, having hobbies that you really enjoy. Things that aren't even school or academic related can be part of extracurricular activities. And these kind of add a little bit to your application rather than just you being like a name on paper with you know, grades and an essay. And then overall extracurricular activities are also able to tie your application theme together. So your application theme is something that's um, usually developed based on how you think you are as a person. So it kind of shows the admissions committee um, what kind of student you'll be, what kind of person you'll be at their school, as well as you know, what kind of healthcare provider you'll be in the future. So themes can range from being someone that really loves to educate the next generation of dentists to someone that loves helping low-income communities to someone that really cares for the special needs community. Any kind of theme you have, it, this is where you kind of show that your theme is really uh, made up of all the things that you've been doing. So um, the first one is um, community service. So Sarah, you can go ahead and take over this one. Yeah, so um, why is it important? Well, dentists, they serve the community. And dental schools look for students who demonstrate a commitment to improving the lives of others. And this is strongly shown through community service. As dentists, you will serve the community by providing care. And there are so many different opportunities that you can be a part of to find ones that you enjoy doing or um, can relate to. So kind of find um, opportunities that you actually are passionate about and you think are cool and interesting. So here are just like some ideas. They don't have to be dental focused, like Brian said. So you, a very common one is uh, your local food banks. You could do like cleanup days at the beach or at the park. Habitat for Humanity was something that was really common in uh, my undergrad. It's where you go out and like help build houses for people in the community that are, um, you know, going through hardship, something happened and they're in need of a new home. And then donating blood or plasma was something that a student one time had asked if they thought that it was something that they should include. And um, Dr. Margolis, I don't know if you guys were familiar with him at UCLA, he did retire, but he thought that it was a very interesting way to show you know, his ability to help people out. I think that's something that's really awesome. And some other, you know, outside of the box ideas are you can maybe like design a mural or something um, in your hometown or wherever. 
and you can host events such as like fundraising. You can collect donations through like a clothes drive or backpacks or um, feminine hygiene care. And you can teach proper hygiene techniques also to maybe areas that might not be as familiar. And like I mentioned earlier, find joy in what you do because Brian, he mentioned, you know, having that theme, I think it's important to kind of find what you are interested in because it will show through when it comes time to apply. Um, like this person really does understand or have a strong um, commitment to whatever it is that they kind of have put a lot of time into. And I think that's stronger than having a lot of other small things here and there, which we'll kind of talk about. And then next is dental experience. So shadowing is a must for dentals for applying to dental school. It's required. And a lot of people always ask, how much shadowing should I do? And typically you want to try and shoot for around a hundred hours to be, you know, competitive in that aspect. And um, the reason why dental experience, especially shadowing is so important is that um, dental schools want to know that you have an understanding of what the dental field is like if you plan on pursuing a career in dentistry. So being able to show that through things like shadowing or going on a dental outreach trip to go serve in communities that are underserved, which could also kind of be like a double dipper for a community service or working in a dental office is also a big plus that people ask about, but it's not required. I know a big chunk of people in our class didn't work in a dental office and yet we still all got here. And um, you know, having front office or back office experience is both really good. I personally had experience working in both and I found both of them to be extremely um, valuable. I know that front office might not seem like the typical position that you would wanna take, but learning about the business side of dentistry is really cool. And you actually learn a lot more than you think that you would. And doing things like this, you know, attending pre-dental days or workshops that dental schools offer helps give you an insight on like the school itself and helps um, prepare you for when it comes time for you to apply or when you're in dental school, whether it be like an impression day, you know, you will be doing impressions when you're in dental school. So it can give you a little bit of experience and things like that. And a lot of people, they struggle sometimes finding opportunities and how to go about that. I know, especially with COVID, it's been really difficult. So schools are aware of that and you're not alone if you're struggling, but some ways that you can find um, opportunities or you can like call around to offices. I know that a lot of them are saying no right now, but it only takes one person to say yes. And then that opens up a door for you. And joining clubs like pre-dental societies, so those have been, um, I think those are really valuable, especially at UCLA. I know that there's a million of them and we do a lot of connecting with them. So it gives you a direct connection to dental students and dental schools and um, has a lot of opportunities for you. And connections also. So um, like Brian and I, we're always more than happy to help you guys in any way possible that we can to give you any advice or, you know, feedback on, you know, things that you should do or that we recommend. And also social media. I'm sure a lot of you guys, we always tell people, follow um, the UCLA ASDA Pre-Dental Outreach Committee Instagram for the most up-to-date stuff. And I think that was the main way that we advertised this. So social media is powerful. And a lot of pre-dental students out there and dental students in general, they share links and things that they know that are going on for opportunities for people like you guys. So um, follow accounts that you think um, provide really good resources. And then the next portion or the next aspect of your extracurriculars is leadership. So dentists are expected to be leaders in their community. And um, this kind of includes like being just in general, like your patients come to you when they need help, when they're in pain, they come to you for you to fix their problems. You're expected to be someone in your community that can help other people. And so leadership is a good quality to have. And it's a quality that's definitely looked at very highly when you're applying. So this can also be included when you're trying to communicate with your patients, when you're trying to lead your staff to work in a more efficient manner. This all has to do with leadership. And some ways you can display leadership are to stick to a few experiences that you contribute a lot to 
it's definitely a lot better to do a couple, be a part of a couple organizations that you work in um, and spend a lot of time in versus being a general member for like 20 different clubs. It's all about depth over breadth. So if you're having major contributions to a couple organizations, you're able to have a bigger impact and people will be able to see that. And that's gonna look very good in terms of your ability to lead groups of people. Um, leadership definitely gives you gives the admissions committee an idea of how you contribute to your, to your class. Um, Dr. Margolis, our past associate dean who just retired, like Sarah said, he always emphasized that um, it's really important that you leave your school better than you found it. And a good way to do this is to be a leader, to be someone who makes changes, who adds good qualities, adds um, new clubs, new ideas, things that will improve your school. So doing things that show leadership, it's that's one way to kind of be that change and be someone that admissions committees really want to have at their school. And then the next aspect of your extracurriculars is research. Um, research is a very commonly talked about topic. It's, um, I know the common question is, do you need to have research? And the um, short answer to that is no. Um, it definitely helps to have research, but in no way whatsoever does any school say, you know, if you don't have research, we're not gonna take you. It's something that will work in your favor, but if you don't have it, it, it will never hurt you. Um, research in general though, if you are doing it, um, you should focus on the process of research that includes like problem solving, managing clinical patients, and organizing and interpreting data. The topic that you're researching doesn't really matter. It's more about your ability to gather a lot of information, process it, and then apply it to a real setting. Because that's kind of what dental school is. You know, you're going through these four years, learning all this content, more content than you know you feel like you need to know. At the end of the day, when you're working, you're going to be applying all this knowledge onto your patients to provide the best care possible. And so research kind of gives you a little gateway into what dentistry is going to be like. Um, so it's definitely helpful. And some pros to research are, uh, I know a lot of schools will include it as like a class. So it's definitely a GPA booster if you do research and you, you know, get all, check all your boxes, do everything right, you'll definitely get like that easy A. Um, it's also good for academic development. I found that, you know, having to read so many articles um, applying all these articles to whatever research I was doing, it helped me more efficiently process and analyze information. So when I was doing classes, going through school, it was easier to read through textbooks, read through slides and understand and apply that knowledge onto exams. And another pro is you get to work closely with faculty. A lot of schools, especially the UC schools, um, your lecture halls are like 400, almost 500 people. So it's definitely hard to get to know your faculty, get to know your professors and get like a good letter of rec. So doing research with these professors is one way where you can really get to work closely with them and build that relationship. And then they're able to talk highly of you and actually get to know you and talk about qualities that you wouldn't really be able to get if you're just meeting with someone for like an hour in an office hour. Um, some cons of research though, it's definitely pretty tedious. Um, it can be very time consuming and stressful. Um, research isn't for everyone, and if you don't enjoy it, but you're doing it anyway, you're not going to be happy. So make sure that you actually enjoy it or that you can, um, you're can. you not like suffering too much because um, at the end of the day, it's not worth it. And um, if you're not passionate about it, there's other things you can allocate your time to that will better improve you as a person and your application rather than forcing yourself to do research. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna be talking about just like in general involvement slash commitments. So it's important to be a well-rounded candidate and have a wide range of extracurriculars on your application. And this will allow admissions to get a better understanding of who you are as a person. So it's okay to not do things dental related. Um, I think it's important to do things that you like, like to do in your free time because um, I think those are really good ways to like help relieve stress. And that's very important to kind of have like a stress outlet when you go into dental school. So they like to know that you're a person, like a human, you're not expected to study and do schoolwork all the time. And you can actually um, learn a lot about someone through their non-dental like related extracurriculars and a lot of different invaluable traits can actually shine through. So for things like sports, it can show that you're a good team leader, or if you hold, um, if you're like a captain of your team, it can demonstrate leadership too. And those are two really good uh, 
traits that um, will shine through your application that you can emphasize what those um, things taught you while you did sports and, you know, how you stepped into a leadership position or, you know, how you had to work as a team and how you guys were able to, um, you know, become one cohesive unit and Greek life. That's another thing that I think a lot of people are a part of during their undergrad time. And that shows a lot of emphasis on philanthropy. So that's like volunteer work and fundraising. So that's also like a really cool double dipper and art that shows how you're able to work with your hands or practice like spatial awareness, which is very big in dentistry and exercise that could be your stress reliever. Like I said, it's important to have those things that help you, um, you know, kind of ease out when it's like a really tough week and you know you just need to kind of get your mindset back into the game and um, mentorship might be something that you are interested in doing and that shows how you're also able to be a leader and you know connect with people because you will be talking to a lot of people and you know listen to them and you know give them an appropriate response so do things that you're passionate about and Brian kind of talked about how um, like dedication slash commitment can be better than like more than just can be better than just like a lot of things showing how you did make an impact or do a change um, goes a long way. So quality over quantity, in my opinion. <laughs> and then um, that's the end of our presentation. Um, Brian, do you want to just end the recording now? And then we can go through questions and stuff. Yeah, sounds good.